So we have learned the actions of chlorpromazine that it's got so many actions. On the basis of these actions, we're going to build up the adverse effects for chlorpromazine. Number one is going to block H1 receptors, is going to block dopaminergic receptors, is going to block 5-HT receptors. I hope something is coming to your mind when it's blockage of H1 receptors, dopaminergic receptors, 5-HT receptors, all this is going to lead to drowsiness, lethargy, sedation and sleep. So all these adverse effects could be remembered on the basis of blockage of H1, DA and 5-HT receptors. Next, if you remember I said chlorpromazine has got alpha blocking action and the alpha receptors are present in the peripheral blood vessels. When you block them, there is vasodilation. So this leads to fall in the blood pressure. So this patient could get postural hypotension, could get lightheadedness, could get a syncopal attack. So that's alpha block. The next one, we already said it's got anti-muscarinic effect. That's atropine-like adverse effect. And by this time, you should be sure about what's anticholinergic or anti-muscarinic effect, classical effects of atropine, dryness of mouth, blurring of vision and photophobia, retention of urine and constipation. This is about the other tissues and as far as heart is concerned, it's going to lead to tachycardia and palpitation. I hope you remember it's photophobia and blurring of vision is happening due to the active, due to the passive midriasis and due to the paralysis of the ciliary muscle of the lens. All this is going to go to the crowding of the substances in the anterior chamber. This is going to increase the intraocular pressure and the glaucoma can be precipitated. So that's about the anticholinergic effects. Increased eating behavior, increased appetite and weight gain. I said it so many times. So I hope you remember the main substance is histaminergic blockade. That's H1 blockade. In addition, dopamine also participates in the eating behavior and also 5-HT. So H1 blockade, 5-HT2 blockade and dopaminergic blockade all leading to appetite and weight gain. But the most important receptor out of this is H1. Please remember this matter for your multiple choice question. A patient was put on, on an antipsychotic drug and the patient has increased appetite and the patient has started gaining weight. Which of the following receptors is most likely to be responsible? All are responsible. H1 is responsible. 5-HT blockade is responsible, especially 5-HT2. And dopaminergic blockade is also responsible. But the most important, the top most out of the three is the histaminergic blockade. That's H1 blockade. Next, chlorpromazine affects the seizure threshold and it can precipitate seizures in the patients who are susceptible, patients who are already suffering from epilepsy. Next important adverse effect we cannot afford to forget is the dopaminergic blockade is going to lead to extrapyramidal reactions, involuntary movements and drug-induced Parkinson. Next, because dopamine itself is prolactin inhibitory factor, we discussed at the beginning, dopamine itself is prolactin inhibitory factor and if you block dopamine, it's like inhibiting PIF. So it's inhibition of prolactin inhibitory factor, inhibition of inhibition leading to increased prolactin. So there is hyperprolactinemia, galactoria, both again leading to amenorrhea and sexual dysfunction and infertility. All this could happen. So this is all dopaminergic blockade and dopamine is prolactin inhibitory factor. You need to remember this. Next, chlorpromazine can produce cholestatic jaundice and I would advise you to remember CH in the spelling of chlorpromazine and CH in the cholestatic jaundice. Chlorpromazine, cholestatic jaundice. It can also produce corneal or lenticular deposits. There are so many adverse effects and all of them can be explained on the basis of number one, dopaminergic blockage. Number two is the blockade of the muscarinic receptors and number three is the blockade of the histaminergic receptors that's H1 block. So remember these three receptors and you will be easily able to differentiate the adverse effects of chlorpromazine. On long term use, chlorpromazine produces tolerance and dependence and it can also produce neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome is usually seen within the first days, 10 days of starting the treatment. So that's an early adverse effect. It's rare, but it could be fatal. What happens in neuroleptic malignant syndrome is the patient gets elevated body temperature. It's called hyperthermia. And it finally leads to encephalopathy. There is severe muscle rigidity and there is muscle damage. 
related to creatine kinase, there's dystonia, there's increased sweating, tachycardia, and the blood pressure is labile, there's autonomic instability. All this is called neuroleptic malignant syndrome and it happens in the early phase of starting the typical antipsychotic drugs and because there is muscle rigidity, you can use dantrolene, which is a direct acting muscle relaxant to treat this. You can give diazepam to quieten the patient and you can use bromocryptin, which is a dopamine agonist. What has happened is you started chlorpromazine and it blocked the dopaminergic receptors all of a sudden and you are getting all these manifestations of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So to revive the dopaminergic receptors or the dopaminergic transmission, you need to use a dopaminergic agonist drug that's bromocryptine. So with all the adverse effects of chlorpromazine we saw until now, I'm adding the last one and very important to remember is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Now I go on to discuss little bit in detail about the extrapyramidal reactions. It's not just enough to say drug-induced Parkinson. What we are saying is it blocks the dopaminergic receptors and is going to lead to involuntary movements. The various types of involuntary movements, a better word for this is extrapyramidal symptoms and it's abbreviated as EPS. There are various types of extrapyramidal symptoms which we get and look at this nice table. It is showing you four different kinds of extrapyramidal movements based on based on the chronological order of their happening. So whatever happens earlier is written first on this table, then what happens, then what happens and finally what. Let's start with the first one. The first one is called acute dystonia. Acute dystonia and this mainly spasmodic or twisting movement. And this happens early that is within hours or one week commonly seen in children or young patients. I am not going to read the whole detail of this but it's spasmodic and twisting movements of various body parts as you can see it here. The next movement which the patient gets is Parkinson and this happens between 5 to 30 days or you can say it's about 4 to 5 weeks you can expect Parkinson and you are conversant with all these symptoms of Parkinson which are very common symptoms tremor, shuffling gait, drooling, stooped posture mask-like faces and cogwheel rigidity. Next movement is a catesia and this happens little later that is between weeks and months maybe up to two months time and it's a compulsive frequent repetitive stereotype movement. The patient is extremely restless. There's, there's severe motor restlessness. The patient can, cannot stand or sit at one particular place in one, at one point in time. The patient has severe inability to sit or stand still at a particular place for more than a short period. So that's called a cathesia. And the last important movement is called tardif dyskinesia. I hope you understand the English meaning of the word tardif. Tard is late. So something which happens very late, tardif dyskinesia. When does this happen? This happens after months to years of use of the antipsychotic drugs. You can't expect it in two months or three months. So the patient has to be on drug treatment say for 7 months, 8 months, 1 year or more often say 5 years, 6 years, 10 years. Then it leads to tardive dyskinesia. It's late to appear, so tardive. There are choreoatheotide movements and there are various movements like lip smacking, worm-like tongue movements, fly catching and the reading movements of tongue, face and body. So what I'm trying to tell you is when you start a typical antipsychotic or older antipsychotic, the first to appear is acute dystonia, which happens within the first week. There's spasmodic movements. The next one, which you can expect is Parkinson, which could happen within the first month or one, one to two months. And that's a classical Parkinson symptom. The third one to appear is a cathesia, in which the patient has a motor restlessness and patient cannot sit or stand still for a short, even for a short period of time. And that happens little late. That's about two months, weeks, two months. That's about two months. And the last to appear is tardive dyskinesia, which happens after months to years. It's worthwhile to remember these movements because sometimes you can get a question which is trying to tell you that the patient is on a typical antipsychotic and he got this kind of movement. They might describe the type of movement which is written here on the right side. And they might tell you the period, the time period, how much time has elapsed after start, starting the antipsychotic drug. And just looking at this particular time period, 
you may be able to differentiate what is this movement. So if it happens during first week dystonia, within one or two months Parkinson, little more months then it's acathesia and months and years is tardive dyskinesia. So that's regarding the extrapyramidal movements. How to manage the adverse effects of these antipsychotic drugs? How to manage all these four movements? Look at the table. For acute dystonia, for Parkinson and for acathesia, we have a common strategy for all the three movements. Acute dystonia, Parkinson and acathesia. A common strategy is to use an anticholinergic drug or an anti-muscarinic agent that's trihexyphenidyl or benzexal. You can remember your drug-induced Parkinson and we said for drug-induced Parkinson, I've also shown here, L-DOPA is not useful. So you need to go to the anticholinergic drug, so that's what I'm saying. So either it could be anti-muscarinic agents or antihistamines like diphenhydramine and in addition, you can use diazepam for this patient. So that's the first line of treatment for acute dystonia, Parkinson and acathesia, either anti-muscarinic or antihistamic drugs and diazepam. Additionally, you have some agents which you can use. One is bromocryptin and the second one is amantadine. One is dopaminergic agonist and the second one is dopamine facilitator. And along with this, you can give a beta blocker because there will be a severe form of anxiety in this patient. So a beta blocker like propranolol. So I think this should take care of the three movements, acute dystonia, Parkinson and acathesia. The last one, the fourth one was tardive dyskinesia. This is happening, this is appearing after years and this is very severe and very difficult to treat. We don't have a definitive drug available to treat tardive dyskinesia. The important, the most important thing to be done in all these movements is you will have to stop the drug, whatever this patient is taking. Especially if this patient is taking an older antipsychotic agent, a typical, stop the older agent and switch to a newer agent. And what's the choice in the newer agent? The best choice is clozapine. And the second one is olanzapine. Why clozapine and olanzapine? These two substances, these two drugs are known to produce least tardive dyskinesia. You can go on giving clozapine and olanzapine over a long period of time and the chances of tardive dyskinesia will be least. So as far as tardive dyskinesia is concerned, our strategy is going to be stop the older agent and switch to clozapine or olanzapine. The last row is telling you about neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's not an extrapyramidal sim symptom. It's not an extrapyramidal reaction. But it's happening due to the dopamine blockade. And because you should not forget about neuroleptic malignant syndrome, I have brought the treatment part on this particular slide. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, I told you there's rigidity of the muscles. You need to relax the muscles. So a directly acting muscle relaxant, dantrolene. As I told you to remember, chlorpromazine for cholestatic jaundice, CH for CH. I repeat, for the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, directly acting muscle relaxant, dantrolene, D for D, directly acting. Then you can use diazepam. And finally, again, bromocryptin, which is a dopaminergic agonist. So this is a way to manage the adverse effect to the antipsychotic drugs. Non-compliance is a very severe issue in patients with schizophrenia. They don't have the understanding of the ground reality. There's no logical reasoning. You cannot expect this patient to take his own medication regularly. Sometimes the people who assist the patient to take the medication, they are in trouble because the patient doesn't listen to you, the patient doesn't understand what you are saying, the patient may throw the tablets, so on and so forth. So non-compliance is a very severe issue. Can we do something for that? Yes, there are some approaches. Flufinazine decanoate, haloperidol decanoate and risperidone microspheres are available. What's the speciality of these drugs? They are given by deep gluteal intramuscular injection and they have got a long effect. The effect lasts up to three weeks. So if the patient is in such a state that the patient is not going to consume the medication in the form of tablets every day, then one of these could be used and you could give it by intramuscular injection and one injection could last its effect for three weeks. So this can deal to some extent with the problem of non-compliance. This can be done as an outpatient treatment and there have been reports that there are less extrapyramidal symptoms if you use the drug in this particular form. So that's about the non-compliance. 
Now we come to the newer or atypical antipsychotic agents. Atypical antipsychotic agents have got a superior adverse effect profile. I want you to understand what I am saying. Superior adverse effect profile. Are you getting the, the meaning of this particular term? I am saying superior. So he's saying it's better as far as what? Adverse effect profile. So if you make a list of adverse effects or if you look at the adverse effects, the severity of the adverse effects, then I want to say that the atypical or the newer antipsychotics are better. It means as far as the adverse effects are concerned, these drugs are superior. They have got less adverse effects. Which adverse effects are less? This slide is telling you alpha blockade is less. So there is less postural hypotension. There is less H1 blockade. So sedation, increase in the appetite, weight gain is comparatively less. There is less dopaminergic blockade. We said they concentrate more on the 5-HT receptors. So there is less dopaminergic blockade. So hyperprolactinemia kind of symptoms are less. Because dopaminergic blockade is comparatively less, there are less extrapyramidal symptoms and there is less muscarinic blockade, so there is less anti-muscarinic effects. Have a look at the slide again. We were worried about that chlorpromazine when we saw so many adverse effects of the drug and this is where the newer or atypical antipsychotics supersede the older antipsychotics. Postural hypotension, alpha blockade is less. Sedation, appetite increase and weight gain is less, that's H1 blocker. Hyperplatinemia and extrapyramidal symptoms are less because there's less DA blocker, that's dopaminergic blocker. And anti-muscarinic effects are less because there's less muscarinic blocker. I already told you the names of the antipsychotic drugs. And let's see if you remember the names of the newer antipsychotic drugs or the atypical antipsychotic drugs. We said there are three drugs which are ending with PIN, P-I-N-E, Clozapine, Olanzapine and Quetiapine. There is one drug which was highlighted blue and it was a newer agent, very promising, Aripiprazole. And there were three agents which were ending with the suffix done. So you had Risperidone, Ciprasidone and Paliperidone. Out of these so many agents, some of the important agents I am taking in the form of a table so that you can compare them otherwise it would be difficult for you to remember drugs one after another and their different adverse effects so if you could put one adverse effect in one row and go on saying that this is less with this less with this or more with this is going to be easier have a look at this table what are the drugs on this table number one is clozapin olanzapin risperidone aripiprazole Quetiapin and Ciprasidone. And we are going to consider all the adverse effects which are produced by these drugs, produced by the older antipsychotic drugs, and compare which drug is better and what's the speciality of the individual agent. The first row is saying about the precipitation of seizure because the seizure threshold is affected. Clozapin and olanzapine, they do produce seizures, they do precipitate seizure and quetiapine also precipitates seizure. So whenever a drug is producing a bad effect, a harmful effect, I have shown in red color. If the drug is better and the effect is less, I am choosing blue color. So that if you look at the drug and if you find more blue colors, you easily understand this drug is better and if there are more reds, you understand this drug is toxic. Is that okay? So let's start with the first row. Clozapine, olanzapine and quetiapine they produce scissor and the scissor is less with risperidone. Look at aripiprazole and ziprasidone, no mention at all. So you don't have to worry. There is no, no question of discussing about the scissor at all. Clozapine, olanzapine in addition are also known to produce pancreatitis. So it's mentioned only for these two drugs. Coming to the next row, we discuss clozapine. Clozapine has got a very typical adverse effect. It produces severe bone marrow suppression in certain patients and the severe bone marrow suppression is going to lead to falling the WBC count so much so that it's very severe agranulocytosis and that's why in the, this box I have written agranulocytosis plus 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 
So it's, it's very important to remember severe granulocytosis and olanzapine is related structurally to clozapine. This also could produce some amount of granulocytosis. But if you go to the other boxes, nil, 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 nil. Risperidone, aripiprazole, quetiapine, and ziprasidone. No risk of granulocytosis. The next issue is about weight gain. And I want you to bring to your mind what's the reason of this weight gain. The reason of weight gain is the H1 blocker, histaminergic blocker, increased appetite that leads to weight gain. Look at this clozapine and olanzapine. For both of them, weight gain is 2 plus. Whereas for this spiritone, weight gain is less. Aripiprazole, weight gain is less. Quetiapine, the weight gain is less. And for ziprasidone, the weight gain is least. And if you look at this particular row, you will immediately understand which drug is best as far as the adverse effect of the weight gain or the H1 blocker is concerned. And I think if you formulate a habit of learning the drugs in this particular form, in the form of a table, is going to be useful to you for solving your MCQs also. Because they are going to ask you four or five drugs and ask you which of the following is least likely to precipitate weight gain and increase eating behavior. Or for that matter, they could ask you which of the following antipsychotics has got minimal H1 blocker. So if it's in the form of a table, this is going to give you a visual impression and you are immediately going to pick up that ziprasidone, least weight gain. The next box is about hypertension, the postural hypertension. What's the reason of the postural hypertension? Just now we discussed. It's alpha receptor blocker in the periphery, in the peripheral blood vessels. You block the alpha receptor, the blood vessel dilates, and if you try to change the posture, if you suddenly stand up from a sitting or lying down position, it's going to lead to very severe hypertension. That's postural hypertension. Postural hypertension, 1 plus, 1 plus, 1 plus for clozapine, olanzapine, risperidone, the first three drugs. And for quetiapine, also it's 1 plus. With aripiprazole, hy postural hypertension is less. And with zeprasidone, the postural hypertension is mild. So it's not, it's not very common. So that's regarding the postural hypertension. The next row is saying about prolactin, PL. So instead of writing the whole term hyperprolactinemia, I prefer to write PL so that you understand it's the effect on prolactin. So if the drug is a dopaminergic blocking agent, it's going to block the PIF and it's going to lead to hyperprolactinemia. So which drug produces maximum effect of hyperprolactinemia? If you look here, only this peridone has got one plus that it can produce hyperprolactinemia. All the other drugs, the chances of hyperprolactinemia are comparatively less. Clozapine, olanzapine, aripiprazole, quetiapine and risperidone. Hyperprolactinemia is less. So this is the first part of the table. This is the first table which is, which is showing you some adverse effect. Just to summarize this table before we go to the next slide and the next part of the table. Clozapine produces severe granulocytosis. That's important to remember. Clozapine and olanzapine have got a susceptibility to precipitate seizures and pancreatitis. Ziprasidone is a drug which has got least capacity or least liability to, to, to produce weight gain because the histaminergic blocker is minimal with ziprasidone. So this is the summary of this, the adverse effects on this particular slide or this table. And now we move on to the next slide to see the further adverse effects.